Hello, uh, welcome to the next lecture in pattern recognition. Uh, in this course so far, in all the lectures we had, uh, about 12 of them so far, we have mainly concentrated on implementing of uh, base classifier. We started with uh, the standard statistical uh, uh, way of formulating the problem, talked about class conditional densities, priors, posterior probabilities, <laughs> looked at the base classifier mainly and then uh, we were discussing how to implement the base classifier. Essentially, base classifier is optimal when we exactly know the posterior probabilities. Since we do not know the posterior probabilities, we use the uh, training set of examples uh, to estimate the class conditional densities and hence the posterior probabilities. Um, which means, when we uh, estimate densities, there would be inaccuracies in the densities. Of course, base classifier is optimal only when we exactly know the posterior probabilities. But when we use estimated densities, the inaccuracies in the density estimation will translate into non-optimality of the implemented base classifier. So, we discussed this earlier. So, but such as it is, we have been looking at how to implement base classifier, how to estimate densities. We consider various methods of estimating densities and how we can implement base classifier with that. Uh, but since this is a problem, in general uh, to relate how inaccuracies in density estimation affects final classification accuracy um, uh, accuracies of the classifier, um, it is uh, you know it is it is often uh, desirable to look at other techniques other than the uh, base classifier for classification. Okay. So, as we seen in the beginning of the course when we gave a overview, there are methods other than base classifier. Uh, one of them that we specifically mentioned is the discriminant function based classification. So, that is what we are going to look at next. Okay. Uh, so, we will start in this class basically with the uh, linear discriminant function based classifiers, okay, what are called linear models for classification. So, let us recall what a discriminant based for a classifier is. Um, in a discriminant based classifier, we, we like we have been doing so far, we will stick to two class classification. Uh, we look at uh, multi class discriminant functions a little later. So, for this class and the next few classes, we are essentially looking at two class classification and also regression problems we look at. So, in a two class classification problem, a discriminant function based classifier is has the following structure. Uh, given a feature vector x, the classifier output h of x is 1 if g x is greater than 0 is equal to 0 otherwise, where g is some pre given function which is called the discriminant function. Right? That is how the discriminant based classifier uh, is formulated. <laughs> uh, once again, uh, which should be 1, which should be 0 is a uh, matter of notation, but in this uh, course we will take if g x is greater than 0, then the class is 1. Okay? Now, a classifier based on that is called a discriminant function based classifier. Sometimes the classifier itself is called a discriminant function, but in any case, the function g is called the discriminant function. Okay. Uh, the base classifier results if you take g x to be q 1 x minus q 0 x, where q 1 and q 0 are the posterior probabilities of class 1 and class 0 respectively. So, g x greater than 0 now means q 1 x greater than q 0 x, in which case I will put in 1, that is the base classifier in the 0 1 uh, uh, loss function uh, model. Okay. So, uh, even the base classifier is essentially discriminant function based classifier, but the issue is that we do not have to take g x to be q 1 x minus q 0 x, we can take many other functions for g x. That is how we get a richer class of classifiers when we look at discriminant function based classifiers. Uh, in general, the discriminant function may have some parameters, uh, say a vector parameters uh, denoted by w. Then we write the discriminant function as g of w comma x and uh, the idea is that um, so far we have been assuming some functional form for the class conditional densities and then using the uh, training samples to estimate the densities and then using the estimated densities to implement a classifier. An equivalent method is to think of some particular functional form for g right, and then need uh, the needed parameters can be estimated directly from the uh, training samples. So, that is the basic idea of discriminant function based classifiers. We use the training data to learn the parameters in the discriminant function. Okay. Specifically, in this class, we look at what are called linear discriminant functions. So, let us consider discriminant function. 
uh, which has let us say d plus 1 parameters, the parameter vector w has components w0, w1, wd and the feature vector is d dimensional with components x1 to xd. Then <coughs> a discipline function which has the following structure summation i is equal to 1 to d w x i plus w0 is called a discipline function uh, is called a linear discipline function. So, a linear classifier or a linear discipline function based classifier both of them are often used as synonymously is one where I put x in class 1 if summation w x i plus w0 is greater than 0 otherwise I put in class 0 ok. So, that is why this is a linear discipline function. Um, basically this is called linear uh, mainly because it is linear in the parameters w. This discipline function has d plus 1 parameters so with the feature vector as dimension d. Uh, those are w0, w1 up to wd and it is essentially a, a linear uh, sum <coughs> with respect to wi. The wi's are the unknown parameters uh, that is what we need to learn and this function is linear in w1's and that is the main reason it is called linear discipline function. All the various techniques we consider for implementing such linear classifiers uh, essentially make use of the fact that this function is linear in its parameters wi. This particular function is also linear in xi. Right? Uh, very often one may confuse that linearity is with respect to xi. Uh, while we normally write the linear discipline function like this, uh, the fact that it is linear in xi is not particularly important for the linear techniques uh, of learning classifiers. Okay? So, basically it being linear in wi is what makes it a linear discipline function. To make this uh, very clear, let us consider generalization. Let us say phi i of x, uh, i running from 1 to d prime where d prime is some number maybe could be greater than d, be some fixed functions. So, given any feature vector x, I can compute phi 1 x, phi 2 x, uh, phi d prime x. Each of these phi's are functions of all components of x, that is why I wrote it as phi i of x. Let us say this phi i are some prefixed function, they cannot be changed, they are, they are not learned using the <coughs> training sample, they are fixed. And then consider a classifier like this hx is 1 if summation i is equal to 1 to d prime w i phi i x plus w naught greater than 0. So, essentially instead of using x i the ith component of the feature vector we are using phi i of x. The idea is that this is also a linear classifier ok. Even if i are non-linear we would still think of this as a linear classifier because it is linear in the adaptable parameters w i. The parameters w i are what are to be learnt and with respect to those parameters this is still a linear function and hence this is called a linear discipline function and the classifier is called a linear classifier ok for any fixed phi i because phi i are not land. <coughs> uh, once again this is a linear discipline function because it is linear in the parameters w i. What this means is that uh, I can write a general linear discipline function in the following form g w comma x is i equal to 1 to d prime w i phi i x plus w naught where phi i's or some fixed functions ok. What it essentially means is that because phi i's are prefixed instead of using x i at the ith feature I am using z i is equal to phi i of x at the ith feature. So, if you think of z i as phi i of x then the vector z, z 1, z 2, z t prime is a new feature vector and with respect to that it is same as the old linear discipline function ok. So, that is the reason why we will still like to call all such things as linear discipline functions and the resulting classifier structures as linear classifiers. As long as phi are fixed all these are linear classifiers. What it means is that all the um, techniques that we are going to present for linear classif uh, classifiers uh, will be valid if we instead of using x i at the features if we use phi i of x at the features where phi 1, phi 2 and so on are some prefixed functions ok. Uh, for the rest of the lecture and for many lectures to follow most of the time we will use x itself as the feature vector. So, we will write the discipline function as w i x i summation w i x i plus w naught, but we will remember that all the algorithms are valid if we change x i by phi of x ok. With this we will revert back to our usual notation of uh, summation w i x i plus w naught ok. Sometimes this phi i are called fixed basis functions we will uh, see later on in the course why that basis function name comes from. Uh, one more small uh, notation uh, which is convenient when we are descri uh, describing uh, linear classifiers. Let us define a new feature vector which we call x tilde 
which is same as the old one except that I put an extra feature 1, uh, extra feature whose value is 1 as the first feature. Okay. So, x tilde is 1, x1, x2, xt is a d plus 1 dimensional vector is called the augmented feature vector. Uh, recall that w the d plus 1 dimensional vector with components w0, w1, wd. So, what I get by this is uh, the LEL displacement function g of w comma x can be written as w0 plus i is equal to 1 to d w x i this is how we define the linear displacement function can now be written as w transpose x i this can be written as simple inner product between the parameter vector w and the augmented feature vector x tilde. So, essentially we can think of this as simply as an inner product without worrying about the constant. Okay. Uh, so, uh, by by considering the feature vector to be augmented with a extra component which is always 1, we can write the linear exponent function simply as w transpose x tilde. So, what we will do uh, in this class as well as for the rest of our discussion on linear classifiers <coughs> that we always assume the feature vector to be augmented. Of course, we would not use the tilde we will st still continue to use uh, the feature vector as x, but whenever we need we simply assume that the feature vector is augmented. So, that we can write linear displacement function as w transpose x. Okay. <coughs> uh, this is useful mainly in linear displacement functions and linear classifiers and also linear models for regression. So, we, we simply write this as w transpose x uh, even though we should write it as x tilde under the implicit understanding that whenever we need we will augment the feature vector like this. Okay. All right. So, now what is learning of uh, linear classifiers? As usual the training set is x i y i, uh, i going from 1 to n. So, such a set of patterns or feature vectors is said to be linearly separable if there exists a w star such that x i transfer w star is greater than 0 if y is equal to 1 and x i transfer w star less than 0 if y is, y is equal to 0. That means, there does exist a linear displacement function with parameters w star which correctly classifies all the training patterns. Okay. Um, note that I am using the augmented feature vector notation here right when I write x i transfer w star I am implicitly assuming that x i is augmented. <coughs> uh, any w star that satisfies uh, this is called a separating hyperplane. Uh, there exists infinitely many separating hyperplanes if the data is linearly separable right here is a simple example. So, is a two dimensional data note that I am showing it in the original space not in the augmented feature space. So, this is one class this is another class. So, they are linearly separable because I can put a line <coughs> and uh, you know any line that passes through this cone that I showed will be a, a separating hyperplane. Essentially, if you consider the middle line here the w will be a a, a vector perpendicular to this hyperplane. Let us say w is in point in this direction, the direction of w is arbitrary, but suppose w is point in this direction, then the dot product between w and any of these patterns, pattern vectors would be positive and the dot product between w which is directed like this and any of these uh, pattern vectors will be negative. Right? That is why uh, 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 the, the, uh, this pattern set is linearly separable and that is what is given by this equation. So, essentially when you say w is a separating hyperplane uh, representationally w star is actually the uh, normal vector to the hyperplane. Okay. Uh, so, w transpose x is equal to 0 is the solution of the hyperplane all points on the hyperplane are perpendicular to w, w transpose x is equal to 0 is the hyperplane. So, w transpose x greater than 0 is one side of the hyperplane, w transpose x less than 0 is the other side of the hyperplane. So, when we said the patterns are linearly separable, we use a strict inequality on either side which means like in this example, no pattern need to be on the separating hyperplane, patterns are strictly away from the separating hyperplane if the because there are only finitely many patterns that are separable, I can always uh, make sure that the separating hyperplane is such that no pattern is on the separating hyperplane. So, that is the reason why we have used strict inequalities on both sides. So, I hope the uh, notation is clear now. The separating hyperplane is this line that separates the two classes. W is actually a, a, a vector perpendicular to this hyperplane. Thus, the equation of the hyperplane is W transpose x is equal to 0. 
So, W transpose x greater than 0 is one side of the hyperplane, the positive side of the hyperplane that is all the fat, um, uh, vectors which have a uh, positive inner product with the uh, um, vector w which is perpendicular to the hyperplane. Right? So, if the hyperplane separates these two, the w vector is the perpendicular to the hyperplane. Okay? And uh, we also noted that when it is separable, no pattern is on the hyperplane that is why both the inequalities are strict. Okay. <coughs> so, what is landing of linear Riskin functions? So, this is our classifier h x uh, is 1 if this sum is greater than 0, uh, 0 otherwise. So, we call the, the sine function as g n, we will write this as g n for this lecture. So, I can also write a w transpose x simplicity assuming that x is augmented. So, sin of w transpose x is my classifier. Okay. So, what is I have to learn? I have to learn the optimal values of w from the training samples. Okay. <coughs> uh, there are many algorithms, we will start with the one, one of the oldest algorithms for this problem, which is arguably the first ever pattern recognition or machine learning algorithm that is ever proposed, uh, that is called the perceptron algorithm. The perceptron learning algorithm is one of the earliest algorithms for learning linear response functions. Um, it can find a separating hyperplane if it exists. So, it works only if the pattern set is linearly separable. Later on, we will see how to um, handle patterns that are not linearly separable. But to start with, we look at the perceptron algorithm, which works only when the uh, pattern set is linearly hyperbole. That is what I mean by it finds a separating hyperplane if a separating hyperplane exists. So, this is what we are going to start with in this class. So, once again for a linear Riskin function, this is the classifier sin of w transpose x. <coughs> so, we can think of this as what is w transpose x is a kind of weighted sum. So, w's are the weights, x's are the, uh, com um, the components of x are the features. So, you find a weighted sum of the features, the w transpose x is simply a weighted sum of the features. So, this is a weighted sum of the features and then the sign simply thresholds it, thresholds it at 0 here. So, if w transpose x is greater than 0, it has one value less than equal to 0 another value. So, we can pictorially think of it as a unit, some unit into which there are various inputs coming x 1 to x t. On each input line, there is a weight w 1 w d. What this unit does is it finds a weighted sum of all its input w 1 x 1 plus w 2 x 2 plus w 1 x n and then thresholds it at w 0 because there is a constant w 0 in this. So, the sign of this is same as uh, finding the weighted sum w 1 x 1 w 2 x 2 w d x t and thresholding it at w 0 that is its output. Okay. Uh, such a unit is what is called perceptron. Uh, it is originally proposed by Rosenblatt in uh, late 1950s. The particular algorithm with its convergence proof first came out in 1962 uh, that is also due to Rosenblatt. Uh, actually, the perceptron was used as a model for neurons, model for how neurons in our brain can learn. Okay. Uh, it is not particularly important for us for this class, but for historical purpose perspective, it is interesting to note that uh, Rosenblatt was actually investigating how we learn to um, recognize mainly visual categories. Okay. Uh, this is one mathematical model he came up with. Uh, at the end of this uh, lecture, I will come back to this figure and explain a little more on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. The perceptron learning algorithm which learns the weight vector w corresponding to a separating hyperplane is an iterative algorithm. Iterative means it is over iterations, it keeps updating. So, uh, at kth iteration w of k, w within brackets k is the value of the current weight vector. From now on we will call the parameters weight vector because as we have seen essentially what the linear discipline function does is a weighted sum. So, the let w k denote the weight vector at the kth iteration. So, at each iteration I update w k. So, w k is updated into w k plus 1. Okay. To do that, what I do is at each iteration I pick a training sample. So, we currently see how to, but this uh, almost any way picking will work. So, let us say x k is the one that is picked at k. So, this could be one of the x 1, x subscript 1, x subscript 2, x subscript n. There are n pattern vectors I have x subscript 1 to x subscript n. So, x of k. Uh, Den, uh, let that denote the, uh, the the training sample that is picked at iteration k and let y of k be the corresponding class label as given in the training set for that pattern. Okay. 
what the <coughs> perceptron algorithm does is it uses the current weight vector namely w k to classify the current sample namely x k and depending on whether this classification turned out to be right or wrong it updates w k into w k plus 1 ok. That is how the perceptron algorithm works is an iterative algorithm like this you start with any orbital w 0 for example, I can take w 0 to be 0 then at each iteration I have current weight vector w k I pick one of the patterns I call that x k then I classify x k using w k and based on the correctness otherwise of that I update w k to w k plus 1 ok. How do I pick? I can pick uh, uh, training pattern sequentially. I can first pick x1, then x2, then x3, then xn, and then once again go over the training set x1, x2, and so on. So I repeatedly keep going over the training set, picking feature vectors one by one. Okay, till the algorithm converges. We'll see what convergence means. We stop when the current weight vector correctly classifies all the training data. So at any time I have, I'm holding a <coughs> uh, weight vector in hand. I pick the next training sample. As I said. Uh, for, for concreteness, let us say I keep going over the training set repeatedly. So, I pick training samples as first x1, then x2, then xn minus uh, and so on, then xn minus 1, then xn, then once again x1, then once x2 and so on. So, <coughs> any time the current weight vector correctly classifies the current sample, I do nothing, I will see the algorithm currently. Otherwise, I change w, I keep doing this and I stop when the current weight vector correctly classifies all the training data. How would I know this? we need a stopping criterion. For example, we can remember in each pass over the data whether or not we had an incorrect classification or I can remember when I had lost incorrect classification right. If the last time I had incorrect classification is more than uh, uh, you know n iterations away n being the training sample because I know I am picking them one by one I know the current weight vector correctly classifies also. So, using some such simple uh, technique of uh, programming <coughs> I can stop by knowing that the current weight vector correctly classifies all the training samples ok. So, if we have a sufficiently long run of no classification errors uh, sufficiently long depends on how many training samples I have then I can stop ok. So, that is the overall, overall view of the algorithm the only thing that is not specified is how to update w k. So, now let us see how to update w k. <coughs> to update w k, so w k plus 1 minus w k is delta w k that means w k plus 1 is w k plus delta w k. So, I have to specify delta w k ok. So, we will specify delta w k as follows. Delta w k is 0 meaning I do nothing I make w k plus 1 w k. If w k transpose x k greater than 0 and y k is 1 or w k transpose x k is less than 0 and y k is equal to 0. So, if the current weight vector correctly classifies the current sample I have to do nothing <coughs> that is that is reasonable because this particular w correctly classified x correctly classified how do I know if y k is 1 I want w k transpose x k to be greater than 0 and if y k is equal to 0 I want w k transpose x k to be less than 0. So, this this if simply tells you whether or not w k correctly classifies x k. So, w k correctly classified x k I do I do not update I keep w k plus 1 equal to w k all right. Otherwise, I have two kinds of errors the two kinds of errors could be on y k is equal to 1 I get w k transpose x k less than 0 or on y k is equal to 1 uh, 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 on y k is equal to 0 I get w k transpose x k greater than 0. So, in each of the others we have to say what to do for w k here is what I do if w k transpose x k is less than or equal to 0 instead of being greater than 0 and y k is 1 then delta w k is x k that means w k plus 1 is w k plus x k which means if I make this kind of error w k transpose x k less than or equal to 0 and y k is equal to 1. I simply add that x k to current w k and if I make the other kind of error w k times x k greater than 0, but y k is equal to 0 I subtract that x k from w k. So, delta w k is minus x k. So, this is the <coughs> perceptron algorithm right. Uh, it is a kind of simple error correction algorithm if I make no error I keep w k plus 1 equal w k if I make error depending on the kind of error I either add or subtract x k. Of course, we will currently see why adding or subtracting can be called error correction. I will we'll see it in a couple of minutes. So, it is a simple error correcting algorithm. Actually, as we will see, <coughs> every time the current sample is incorrectly classified, we are locally trying to correct the error. How are we locally trying to correct the error? Let us look at the error correction. The two cases one is WK transpose XK less than or equal to 0, YK is equal to 1, then we add XK. Let us look at what it does. <coughs> 
So, when W k times by x k less than 0, y k is equal to 1. What is the error? When y k is equal to 1, uh, to correctly classify x k, I should have had W k times by x k to be positive. So, somehow I have to change W k so that the, if I take in W k plus 1 transpose x k, it, it possibly would become positive. Right? So, what have I done? Now, W k plus 1 transpose x k, in this particular case W k plus 1 is W k plus x k, in this case where the correction is to add x k. So, W k plus 1 transpose x k is W k transpose x k plus x k transpose x k. So, actually I had w, uh, uh, w k transpose x k to be less than 0, while I wanted to be greater than 0. So, I am ensuring that W k plus 1 uh, transpose x k is the whole W k transpose x k plus some positive quantity, right? which means I have ensured that W k plus 1 transpose x k is greater than W k transpose x k. I have made an error because W k transpose x k is less than 0. So, the right direction of changing W is such that W k plus 1 transpose x k should increase relative to W k transpose x k. That is what adding x k does. <coughs> in a similar way, when W k transpose x k is greater than 0 and y k is equal to 0, essentially we have to decrease this inner product. That is why I am subtracting x k from uh, W k. So, W k plus 1 transpose x k by the same token will be less than W k transpose x k. So, this is how the corrections are. Right? So, in, in, in both times, I am correcting W k. So, that intuitively next time around, at least I have moved this w, w transpose x in the right direction, okay. that the corrections are intuitive. Okay. It is very simple as I said, locally try to correct the error just for that particular x k <coughs> and essentially adding or subtracting x k simply ensures that I am correcting in the right direction. Okay. So, that is the motivation for the algorithm to see is very simple minded so to say, uh, just locally uh, try to correct the error. However, it is not clear why such a simple minded algorithm should work. I, I hope you people see it is very simple and what is remarkable about it is that it always finds a separate hyper prime. What do you mean by it is not clear why the algorithm should work? Firstly, while W k plus 1 transpose x k is more than W k transpose x k when it should increase, W k transpose x k was negative. So, I added x k so that W k plus 1 transpose x k is more than W k transpose x k, but does not mean that W k plus 1 transpose x k has become positive because so to say the step size I am just adding x and the magnitude of x I do not know. So, I am not even ensured that at least W k plus 1 correctly classifies x, I am just moving in the right direction. So, there is not even a guarantee that W k plus 1 correctly classifies x k. More importantly, when I correct W k to take care of x k, the corrected W k may now misclassify some other feature vector which I classified correctly. Earlier I might have looked at some other x which is corrected correct, which is classified correctly. So, I did not do anything to W k. Now, when I modify W k, I have no way of knowing whether what all earlier corrections have undone. Right? So, really uh, uh, there is there is I, I just do not know why this should work at all. So, given that it is really remarkable that this algorithm works, okay. we will prove it uh, formally. I, I just want you want you to see that uh, <coughs> while it is intuitive and very simple, it is also a very remarkable result that such a simple algorithm always gives you a separating hyperplane. There is also a geometric way of looking at uh, the problem. <coughs> so, let us look at uh, like this, let us say this is my data set all the blues are one class, all the greens are other class and the, these are uh, linearly separable. Uh, note that in the augmented feature space, because I am talking about w, uh, w transpose x greater than 0 less than 0 uh, and w transpose x equal to 0 is the hyperplane, the hyperplane always passes to the origin in the augmented feature space. Okay. So, of course, the feature vectors are close, but not on the hyperplane. Okay. I have taken a slightly tough problem, but the the two classes are still linearly separable. Okay. Now, let us say on this problem at some iteration we had one particular uh, w vector. So, let us say this is the hyperplane I am currently considering, this is the normal to the hyperplane and let us say this is the positive direction. So, this is my w vector, the vector that is shown is the w vector and the line shown in uh, uh, <coughs> dashes, the magenta line is the current hyperplane. So, all my 
blues are in the positive class, all my reds are in the negative class. So, there is one blue thing which is circled, which is incorrectly classified by this particular hyperplane. Okay. So, what is that I do for correction? I take this w vector to that I add the x vector, x vector is the line that joins origin to this incorrectly classified point and that gives me new w k plus 1. Let us do that computation. So, uh, as, as earlier that is my earlier w vector and this line is the x k that is incorrectly classified. Now, I have shown you the parallelogram law, the vector addition. So, if I add this vector to that vector, I get this green vector. So, that is the new w k plus 1, which means this is the new hyperplane. So, effectively adding this incorrectly classified x to this w means I am rotating this hyperplane around the origin in the direction in which this particular sample is. In this case, is in the counterclockwise direction. Right. So, adding this x to w is simply rotating. So, adding and similarly subtracting will be rotating in the other direction because subtracting is simply uh, reversing the direction of that vector and adding. So, I am just rotating the hyperplane. So, each correction is essentially rotating the hyperplane uh, so that uh, in a direction so that uh, the incorrectly classified sample comes on the right uh, hopefully comes on the right side of the hyperplane. In this particular example by this amount of rotation the incorrectly classified sample has now come on the right side. However, earlier this hyperplane was correctly classifying that sample, right? That sample was on the positive side of the dashed hyperplane. Now, when I rotated this to take care of this, right? Now, this has come on the wrong side <coughs> of the hyperplane. Now, it has come on the negative side of the hyperplane, right? So, this shows us both that the adding x and subtracting x to w is simply rotating the hyperplane. In, in the correct direction, correct direction as far as that particular sample is concerned. Now, the rotation of course, in this particular example rotation action is sufficient to correctly classify that sample that is one problem. The second problem is when I rotate like that something else that was correctly classified earlier may now become incorrectly classified. As I said that keeps on going, I, I keep going on the training samples repeatedly, I keep rotating the hyperplane this way that way every time I see the next sample and somehow at the end I come to the so, let us get over this again. So, that is the original hyperplane that is the wrongly classified sample. So, I have to rotate the hyperplane counterclockwise to take care of it and that is what my uh, perceptron algorithm does. Okay. All right. <coughs> now, <coughs> given that we got the algorithm, uh, let us look at the convergence. So, we now show that the algorithm lands a separating hyperplane. How do we show that? Uh, okay, we first uh, um, before we go there, let's put some notation. Uh, first, recall that all feature vectors are augmented. In this, we are assuming all feature vectors are augmented. That's why, as I said, the hyperplane always passes through the origin. In addition, let's suppose that in the training set, we will first take the training set and then multiply all xi whose corresponding yi are zero with minus one. What did what did this do to me? This means that a weight vector w represents a separating hyperplane if w transpose x i greater than 0 for all i. I do not have to look at y i anymore. If I simply multiply all x i whose corresponding y i is equal to 0, then I do not need y i in my uh, for implementing my algorithm. Now, I am working towards finding a w so that w transpose x i greater than 0 for all i. Right? Because if it is a y i is equal to plus 1 vector, then w transpose x i greater than 0. If is a y i is equal to 0 class, then the original x i has been multiplied by minus 1 to make this x i. So, if this w transpose x i greater than 0, for the original feature vector will be negative. Okay. So, by this simple notational device of assuming that in the training set all uh, y is equal to 0 class uh, feature vectors are multiplied by minus 1. Now, a separating hyperplane is simply defined by w transpose x i greater than 0 for all i. Okay. And similarly, uh, this simplifies our notation as follows. Under our notation, the perceptron algorithm simply if w transpose x, uh, w k transpose x k is less than or equal to 0, we add x. There is no adding or subtracting anymore. 
because we are adding y is equal, y is equal to 1 patterns and uh, subtracting y is equal to 0 patterns, but now all the y is equal to 0 patterns are multiplied by minus 1. So, for all patterns is only addition. So, now my algorithm is very simple. If W k transpose x k greater than 0, do nothing. If W k transpose x k less than or equal to 0, add x k to W k. Right? So, by the simple device of assuming that all the uh, the um, 0 class patterns are multiplied by minus 1, I can notationally simplify my uh, perceptron algorithm. Okay. <coughs> the second simplification we make is let us say we count our iterations only when the weight vector is updated. Right? So, as k goes every, every iteration I am picking up an x k, if w k transpose x k greater than 0, we are saying w k plus 1 is equal to w k. If because w k plus 1 is equal to w k, I can simply assume k is not incremented. So, I increment k only whenever I have a correction, so that I get successively different w's. So, I consider a sequence updated like that, where k increments only when there is a correction. Okay. So, <coughs> under this the perceptron algorithm till it actually converges, that is what this for all k means, not really for all k till it actually converges is like this is always w k transpose x k less than or equal to 0 and w k plus 1 is equal to w k plus x k, because that is how I am, I am counting my case. Okay. The algorithm stops when it finds its operating hyperplane. So, it keeps on going like that after some k it would not update at all, the k would not increase because now everything is correctly classified. So, if it stops then uh, because everything is correctly classified. Uh, that is the final w k. So, there will be a, a maximum k at which it will stop. Okay. Uh, until that time, this is the algorithm because I am incrementing my iteration count only when I had a error. Okay. <coughs> now, we want to show that the algorithm finds a separating hyperplane if the data is linearly separable. We prove this by contradiction. That is, we first assume that the algorithm fails to find a separating hyperplane even though one exists and then show that it cannot be. If the perceptron algorithm ever stops that it w k is no longer updated uh, and uh, w k transpose x k greater than 0 <coughs> remains greater than 0 for all k, then it has found a separating hyperplane. So, what it means is that if the algorithm fails that was assuming that the algorithm fails to find a separating hyperplane, that means this keeps on going that at every k w k transpose x k less than or equal to 0 and hence w k, uh, k plus 1 equal to w k plus x k that keeps on going for all k. The k, k does not stop ever, k keeps going. So, if perceptron algorithm fails to find a separating hyperplane, then we must have this for all k. Okay. So, now <coughs> under that let us see uh, a contradiction. Under the perceptron algorithm we have w k plus 1 equal to w k plus x k. Now, I am saying that this keeps on going without a stop, the iteration count keeps increasing. Now, using this we know w k plus 1 norm square this two lines denote norm. So, w k plus 1 norm square because w k plus 1 is this is w k plus x k norm square. Now, let us expand this uh, norm square to get w w k norm square plus x k norm square plus 2 w k transpose x k. Now, our iteration count or iteration such that at each k w k transpose x k is always less than or equal to 0. So, which means w norm of w k plus 1 whole square is less than or equal to norm of w k whole square plus norm of x k whole square, because this is always less than or equal to 0. <coughs> okay. So, now I can recurse on this. So, we have w, so I had w k plus 1, so put k. So, w k norm square is w k minus 1 norm square plus x k minus 1 norm square norm square. Now, the same thing is true for w k minus 1 norm square, that is w k minus 2 norm square plus x k minus 2 norm square plus x k minus 1 norm square and so on. So, if I recurs on that ultimately I get w 0 norm square plus x i norm square i is equal to 0 to k by 1. Note that this is x bracket psi, this is the ith x I, I picked while going down the things which has uh, the ith time I had to correct. Right. <coughs> so, this x within bracket psi would be one of the x 1 to x and I do not know which one, but that happened to be the ith time I corrected the uh, w as they, as they kept going uh, again and again over the features. So, I get w k norm square given by this. Okay. 
with our loss of generality let's assume w0 is equal to 0 uh, we can do the same proof without that but um, there are only finitely many vectors xi so each of them has some length some norm so let m denote the maximum norm of all the xi now we have wk norm square is w0 norm square plus this so because the w0 is 0, 0 and maximum of xi norm square is m <coughs> this simply becomes k times m so norm of wk whole square is bounded above by k times a constant so it increases linearly with k okay so if the perceptron algorithm keeps making error sometime or the other as i keep going again and again on the samples so that the iteration counts keeps increasing then the norm of wk keeps increasing linearly with k okay this is one relation that we got <coughs> we will get one more once again under the algorithm wk plus 1 is equal to wk plus xk hence wk can be written as wk minus 1 plus xk minus 1 now wk minus 1 can be written as wk minus 2 plus xk minus 2 plus xk minus 1 this should be i am sorry this is xk minus 1 and so on you recurs you get w0 plus i is equal to 0 to k minus 1 x i uh, please note that this k minus 2 is actually k minus 1 okay so using the, under this algorithm wk is simply w0 plus i is equal to 0 to k minus 1 xi this is not surprising because every time we are adding the x some x one of the feature vectors which happen to be incorrectly classified is added to w so at any given time uh, the current w is simply sum of some of the xi those xi that i have picked up and made uh, which were in, incorrectly classified added to w0 of course w0 is uh, taken to be 0 so while this is not really important for us in the uh, proof as such of this this relation is important but this relation also tells us one thing extra namely that this shows that wk is always some linear combination of the feature vectors each of x brackets i is one of the feature vectors while i don't know which one ultimately this sum will be some linear combination of the feature vectors so at any given time wk is a linear combination of the feature vectors and hence my separating hyperplane because we will ultimately going to show this algorithm by separating hyperplane would be actually a linear combination of feature vectors while that fact is not really important in this proof uh, that the separating hyperplane will be a linear combination of feature vectors will become useful to us later in the course so i just mentioned it but anyway let that be now so far we have not used the fact that we are assuming data to be linearly separable because we are assuming data to be linearly separable there exists a w star so that x subscript i transpose w star together x subscript i when you use the specific i uh, training sample x within brackets i is the as i am going down the feature vector uh, down the training sample keep picking feature vectors that is the i time I, I made a correction so that can be any of these x's but this x subscript i transpose is feature vector so for each of the i is equal to 1 to n x i transpose w star is greater than 0 such a w star exists okay now <coughs> let gamma be minimum over all these x i transpose w star now because each of them is greater than 0 this gamma will also be greater than 0 now we had w k is this this is anyway 0 so if a 2 w k transpose w star that will be sum of x i transpose w star so w k transpose w star is sum of x i transpose w star and we know each of this is at least gamma they are k of them so this is greater than or equal to k gamma right so we show that w k transpose w star is greater than or equal to k gamma right Where once again this is gamma is some quantity greater than 0 so this is greater than 0 so we showed two things one is norm w square is the norm w k square is bounded above by k times a constant and now w k transpose w star is bounded from the other side by k gamma let us put all this together because uh, this k gamma is positive we also know k square gamma square is less than or equal to this whole square so first we have k square gamma square less than or equal to w k transfer w star whole square uh, this is an inner product uh, as you know uh, the inner product between two vectors is bounded above by the squares of the individual norm the so called cauchy swaj inequality so wk transfer w star whole square is bounded above by wk norm square 
plus W star norm square. And then we know W k norm square is bounded above by k times m. So, this is W star norm square into k times m. So, if these iterations keep going on that is if misclassifications of the feature vector keep going on right then this has to be satisfied for all k right. So, this should be true for all k if the algorithm keeps updating the weight vector without any limit right. So, what we showed so far is if the algorithm keeps updating w k without uh, <coughs> an upper limit on k then I should have this satisfied, but this I cannot satisfy because the left hand side is growing as k square, right hand side is growing only as k. So, in respect of the values of gamma m and w star, a k must come when this can no longer be satisfied. As a matter of fact, I know what that k is by dividing by k, we know that this can be true only till k less than some quantity w star whole square m by gamma square, which means the corrections cannot go on forever. After this k, the corrections have to stop if uh, the patterns are separable. Right? So, hence the algorithm finds a separating hyperplane in finitely many iterations. It is a remarkable result. We showed that this very simple minded algorithm which just does some local corrections of rotating the hyperplane clockwise or counterclockwise around the origin just to locally take care of the current <coughs> uh, sample will stop after finitely many iterations with and if it stops it has to be a separating hyperplane right? if the training data is linear separable. Of course, the training data is linear separable is given by there being a w star such that this gamma exists. Okay. <coughs> so, what we showed is that the perceptron algorithm finds a separating hyperplane in finitely many iterations, finitely many because k cannot go beyond this number. Right? This number is some finite number m is the uh, upper bound on the norm of all the xi, w star is the is a separating hyperplane and gamma is the minimum of w star transpose xi over all i which must be positive because w star is a separating hyperplane. Okay. <laughs> so, what we showed is that perceptron algorithm finds a separating hyperplane if it exists in finitely many iterations, uh, but of course, we do not know the bound on the iterations right. To know the bound on the iterations we need to know w star as well as gamma m we know because we know x i's, but we neither know w star no, uh, because we do not know w star we do not know gamma. So, while the proof tells me that it has to stop infinitely many iterations I cannot calculate the bone which means in a particular case I do not know how many iterations to run the algorithm. Only thing I am guaranteed is if the training data is linearly separable and if I run the algorithm for enough time I will always converge <coughs> with a separating hyperplane. In spite of the fact that I cannot calculate the bound, the proof shows that our simple error correcting procedure is effective, right? Which is which is remarkable. Uh, this is uh, arguably the first provably correct learning algorithm, you know, 1962. <coughs> if the data is not linearly separable, then in general the algorithm will not stop. That means it will go into an infinite loop. So, if the data is linearly separable, I know sometime or the other it will stop and give me a separate hyperplane. But if the data is not linearly separable, then I cannot even guarantee that the algorithm stops. All right. <coughs> yeah. Um, this is the algorithm uh, under the notation that all the y is equal to zero patterns are multiplied by minus one. The proof can be the, the proof that we did uh, also takes care of many generalizations. For example, I'm allowed to put a step size here. If instead of adding x k, if I put eta times x k, it is still all right because as long as eta is positive, everything in the proof goes through. Right? <coughs> also, we did not really assume anything specific about how patterns are picked. We, for concreteness, we say patterns are picked one by one, but you can pick patterns in any which way. For example, in one pause, you can pick them from left to right, another pause, you can pick them from right to left, absolutely no problem. <coughs> as long as you keep picking all patterns repeatedly, we do not leave out anything so that when corrections stop we know that uh, all the patterns are classified correctly. As long as we keep picking uh, all patterns repeatedly we can use any any reasonable order of picking patterns. Okay. So, many such variations can be justified from the same proof. Okay. All right. <coughs> uh, there are a couple of uh, other issues with the algorithm well, let us quickly go through them. 
The algorithm as presented is termed a incremental or online algorithm. What does that mean? We essentially using one example at a time, as I said, picking, right? So, you give me one example. So, I can ask somebody else to give me an example from the uh, training set, right? So, we use only one example at a time. In principle, I do not need to store all the examples. If I have a stream of examples coming and they are statistically such that if I uh, if I keep doing this correction sooner or later, uh, everything will be uh, correctly classified or if the stream repeats itself. So, in principle, I can learn from a stream of examples without storing them. That is what is meant by incremental. I do not need all the examples in the main memory, for example. Okay. As opposed to this, we can have a batch version where I can keep all the examples with me and then uh, do the corrections. For example, what I can do is I can make one pass all the all examples with the same WK keep track of all the wrongly classified examples and then affect all the corrections. So, now k will not be iterations like earlier, but now k keeps track of the passes of the data. My first pass of the data, I keep track of all the access that are incorrectly classified and then do only one short correction. Right? So, for example, I can have it like this. <coughs> Let us say as earlier, we assume that x i with y is equal to 0 multiplied by minus 1. So, I essentially looking for a w, so the w transpose x i is greater than 0. So, at a given pass, kth pass of the data, w k transpose x, if w k transpose x less than 0, put j in a set called s k. So, s k contains the indices of all the training samples, which are currently, uh, which are incorrectly classified by the current w. Right. Now, I can <coughs> have a batch version, which simply means after the kth pass over the data, w is updated by w k plus 1 is w k plus sum of all the x j's over the set s k. So, I have keep one WK with which I classify all the patterns. Remember which are all the patterns which are wrongly classified, add all those X, uh, XJs to this WK, right. This is called a batch version of the batch of algorithm. Intuitively, this should also work and we will show why this should work by looking at a different perspective. Earlier, we looked at uh, uh, perceptron as an error correcting thing, locally correcting errors, uh, that is the incremental algorithm. We look at the batch algorithm as a simple optimization procedure. As you have seen during the base classifier, we can rate algorithms, uh, we can rate different classifiers through some risk functions, uh, which are some figure of merit for the classifier and then minimize that figure of merit, right. So, for each W like that, we can define a figure of merit. J, let us call that figure of merit J. J of W is minus of W transpose X J, where J goes over all W uh, J is such that W transpose X J less than equal. So, given any W, I will find out what are all the X J that it wrongly classifies and then add all those W transpose X J s and put a minus sign outside and that is the figure of merit for W. So, more things it wrongly classifies, J is larger, but it does not tell me the number of wrongly classified because it actually adds this W transpose X J of all the wrongly classified ones. First, let us notice that if W star is a separating hyperplane, right, then for all x j W star transpose x j will be positive and the sum will be 0, there will be nothing in the sum. So, j of W star will be 0. Secondly, I am adding W transpose x j only when W transpose x j is equal to is less than or equal to 0 and I put a minus sign here. So, j W is always greater than 0 for any W or this is separating hyperplane. For all possible vectors W, j of W greater than 0. So, I can simply, I can simply um, minimize j of w for my uh, to get the best w. Right. So, we can learn the separating hyperplane by minimizing j. So, we want to minimize this function. How do I minimize? I can use a simple gradient descent on the objective function. So, what will be a gradient descent? w k plus 1 is w k minus some step size eta times gradient of this function j evaluated at the current value w k. Right. This is the standard gradient descent algorithm. What is the gradient of this with respect to W? Is simply summation of X J S. Right? So, that will be W K plus eta times summation of X J, all J S other W K transpose X J less than 0. So, this is same as J belonging to S K as we called earlier. Right? So, uh, this, be this becomes plus because of this minus sign in my definition of J, which means a, a gradient descent on this uh, on this uh, mm, <coughs> on this uh, uh, criterion function e the batch of perceptron. So, this criterion function is uh, uh, called the perceptron criterion function 
and the perceptron algorithm, the batch version, can be seen to be minimizing this <coughs> gradient function. So, perceptron algorithm can also be viewed as simply a gradient descent on a on a nice reasonable Cartesian function and hence it should perform well right. We can either look at it as locally correcting or we can look at it as minimizing a, uh, a well defined criterion function ok. So, <coughs> let us sum up the perceptron is a very interesting device. It is a simple weighted sum and threshold and is also a learning machine the neuron model right. Um, <coughs> most of our brains computing elements are called neurons and at a simple level certainly at the level neurons are understood in 60s this is a very good model for a neuron. A neuron simply has many inputs and it takes a weighted sum of its inputs and thresholds it at some point to decide whether it is going to have a 1 output or a 0 output. Now, as a matter of fact as, as we already mentioned this excess uh, can be phi i f x right there can be any fixed functions. Originally, the perceptron algorithm was proposed as a model of how we learn visual pattern recognition. So, the way we can think of it is that this is actually a phi of x. So, in front of our retina, there might be some visual pattern and we are inbuilt with some uh, feature detectors. So, there are d such feature detectors let us say given a particular pattern each of them will have some values. We are built with those feature detectors. The feature detectors are not built uh, assuming that we need to differentiate between ambassador cards and uh, uh, Maruti cards are differentiate between uh, you know dogs and cats or whatever. So, whatever we are built we are born with or inbuilt. So, given that we have some fixed feature functions which are inbuilt, if I given examples right, then the idea is can I learn, can my neurons learn the weights in the weighted sum, so that I can learn to categorize right. That is what the perceptron algorithm does. So, originally the perceptron algorithm is proposed as a model of how we learn visual pattern recognition. Uh, the phi's can be viewed as inbuilt feature functions uh, the and the other thing is the algorithm only needs local computations because to update w I, I add x which means to update this weight I only need to know this value right. So, it is locally available right. So, even though there might be many many connections here each weight can update itself by locally knowing the value here right that is also uh, an interesting this thing. So, the model is uh, first one of the so called neural network models for learning ok. So, we will stop there uh, for the perceptron algorithm uh, next class we will see how to go beyond perceptron to be able to take care of uh, cases where data is not really separable. We will start by what I have just done we will look at the perceptron algorithm again uh, just the, the final bit of perceptron and then go beyond that ok. Thank you.